you would open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19, verse 16. Our text this morning is Matthew 19, verses 16 to 30. And if you please stand for the reading of the Word of God. Hear now the Word of the Lord from Matthew 19, 16 to 30. And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or fathers, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. That is God's word. Let us pray. Father, we come before you this morning on this Lord's Day in confession, acknowledgement of our sins and our unworthiness to approach you, and in thanks that because of Christ and his work on our behalf, we can come and worship you. And we come asking that you would prepare our hearts for the preaching of the word. We ask that your spirit would illumine our minds to understand and that you would empower me to speak truthfully from the text of scripture and that you would do a work in the heart of everyone present today. Apart from your working, this word will not accomplish anything. We ask that it would correct, convict, teach, and train us all in righteousness. We thank you for your word. And we ask that you would bless the sermon this morning. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. What do you value in life? What do you treasure? What is that one thing that you hold on to most tightly and are least willing to let go of. Imagine a scenario with me. You're out one day, passing by a slum, and you notice a child playing there. And he's playing in the mud. 
He's filthy, covered in mud, but this is what he's doing for fun. He's playing with mud pies in a slum. And you feel compassion for him and you think to yourself, there is something so much more than that. I want to do something for this child. I want to give him an experience that is so much better than what he has now. This is all he has, this is all he knows. I wanna show him that there's more than that. So you make a plan. You plan to give him an outing to the beach, a full day at a beach resort. You find a resort, you set aside some money, do your budgeting, you make the reservation. Full day, he can play in the water, he can play on the sand, he can eat, enjoy the fresh air and the sunshine. It'll be a wonderful time and completely free for the child. You set everything up and the day comes where you go to make the offer and you approach the child and say, hey, I have a gift for you. It's free, it'll be so much fun, you'll love it. I'm gonna go to the beach and play in the water, play in the sand and get out of this and experience something else. And it's free, you don't have to pay anything, do anything for it. Just get up out of the mud, put the mud pie down, leave the slum and we'll go. And when you say that, the child becomes sad. He looks at the mud in his hands. He looks at you and he says, no, I'm not gonna leave this. He prefers the mud to what you are freely offering. One of the most popular quotes of C.S. Lewis goes like this. If we consider the unblushing promises and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by an offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Our text this morning looks at a situation like that. We are in Matthew chapter 19, 16 to 30. And by this point in the Gospel of Matthew, many people have come to Jesus for different things. Many have come to him for healing the lame, the blind, the leper, and Jesus has healed them. The demon possessed have come to him and Jesus has cast out the spirits. People have even come to Jesus to eat. Others came demanding signs from him. And those with that malicious intent came to get in a quarrel with Jesus and try to trap him in his words. And many, of course, came to him expecting him to liberate them from Rome. But one man came with a concern that was infinitely more important than all of those things put together. One man came to him wanting to know what he must do to have eternal life. All of you at one point have had that question, or maybe you have it still to this day. Appropriately so. Eternal life, salvation, entering the kingdom of God is the greatest need of fallen humanity. Since Adam fell into sin, all his descendants have been guilty and deserving of condemnation and corrupt in their nature and unable, in fact, opposed to doing good. Not only are we sinful and worthy of God's judgment, but there is nothing we can do to change our condition. We cannot cure ourselves. Because we are fallen, we end up worshiping things that are not God. We exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship the creature rather than the creator. As John Calvin so eloquently put it, man's nature, so to speak, is a perpetual factory of idols. Left to ourselves, we stay in the mud. 
in the slum. Our text speaks to this situation. The point of the sermon this morning, what I want you to walk away with and remember, is having eternal life is impossible by our good deeds, but possible with God. Therefore, repent of your idols, believe in the Lord Jesus, and follow him looking forward to glory. I'll say it once more. Having eternal life is impossible by our good deeds, but possible with God. Therefore, repent of your idols, believe in the Lord Jesus, and follow him looking forward to glory. Like the rich young man, you may wonder, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Let's look at verses 16 and almost all of 17. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. It's an interesting question. Notice what exactly he's asking. What good deed must I do to have eternal life? Not merely, how can I enter the kingdom of God, but what good deed must I do for that? There are some assumptions that this young man is making, and there's two of them. He's assuming a works righteousness system of salvation. He's assuming that eternal life is something to be worked for, something to do on his part. He's assuming that eternal life can be earned by good works. Teacher, what good thing do I need to do to have eternal life? That's the first thing that's being assumed. The second is that he is able to do a good work at all. Not only does he assume good works are necessary for salvation, for his justification, but that he, a fallen human being, is able to to do a good work in the first place. That he can do, that he has the ability to do good, even good towards his own salvation. That's what he's assuming. And if we're familiar with the Gospels at all, that way of thinking is common among the people that Jesus talks with. So he's come up to Jesus and asked, what do I need to do to have eternal life? He's opened himself up to evangelism. Maybe some of you have had this happen. If not, what would you do? Somebody asks, hey, would you happen to know what I need to do to go to heaven? <laughs> the ice breaking doesn't need to take place. They've invited you <laughs> to tell them the truth. He is an evangelistic prospect. Does Jesus answer him directly? No, Jesus stops him right in his tracks. Jesus, what are you doing? <laughs> He stops him. Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. Why on earth would he say that? Well, it's actually necessary. Jesus is challenging this man's understanding of goodness. This man does not know what good is. He's challenging the young man's concept of good. What, he's, what Christ is implying is, young man, you are not good. Only God is good. God is good, and therefore the standard of what is good. You don't know what good is. As we'll see through the conversation, it was necessary for Jesus to put this out there right in the beginning. Because that standard of goodness is going to come up again. Jesus points to the standard of good. To know what good is, look at God. And the young man, of course, as a Jew, should know this. He has his old covenant scriptures. He should know that the Bible said already, none are good, none are righteous, no one seeks after God. He should know that. And that question needs to be asked of everyone. What's good? What is your standard of good? If it's not God, it's wrong. And so the next part of our text, to enter life on your own, you must keep the commandments from the rest of verse 17 to 19. 
If you would enter life, Jesus says, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness on your father and mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus here answers the question, and right after establishing that only God is good, he points at where God has revealed his holy, perfect, and good character, the moral law of God. That's the standard of goodness in print, written down, the moral law of God. That's what good is. Keep the commandments, he says. And which commandments are these? We recognize them as from the Ten Commandments, or the Decalogue. And Jesus lists, you shall not murder, the Sixth Commandment. Don't commit adultery. Seven, do not steal. Eight, shall not bear false witness. Nine, he doesn't mention ten, honor your father and mother, the Fifth Commandment. And the summary statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which is also from the Old Testament, Leviticus 19.18 and which Jesus in another place uses to summarize the second table of the law containing our duty to one another. This is what Jesus says, keep the commandments. And the man asks, which ones? It's possible he was confused. There are a lot of civil and ceremonial laws, commandments to be followed. Jesus gets specific with him. And he names the second table of the law. But in case we missed it, notice how Jesus is answering. The man asks, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. Did Jesus really just say that? Or what if you told somebody that? Or if, what if you heard that preached from this pulpit? You want to have eternal life? Obey the law of God. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, this is Jesus talking. Is he lying? No, that's impossible. Jesus, as always, tells the truth. Is he making a mistake? No, that's not possible either. Jesus is giving a correct answer here. Keep the commandments. Is eternal life able to be gained by us by keeping the commandments? No, it's not. But it wasn't always that way, was it? Think back, all the way back to the beginning. The beginning. I'm Presbyterian, so I'm going to quote to you from the Westminster Confession of Faith about God's law. God gave to Adam a law as a covenant of works by which he bound him and all his descendants to personal, entire, exact, and perpetual obedience, promised life upon the fulfilling and threatened death upon the breach of it, and endued him with power and ability to keep it. Look back to man as originally created. God created man perfect in true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. No sin able to perfectly obey God. If he didn't obey God, death would be the penalty. If he did continue to obey God, eternal life is the promise. Well, we know what happened. He broke that covenant of works. And as a result, all his descendants, his posterity are guilty and corrupt, unable to perfectly obey anymore. Man, as originally created, was free and able to keep God's moral law and thereby enter into life. Now, when man fell, did the, did the law of God disappear? No. Did God say, oh, okay, I'll give you something less difficult to do so you can save yourself? No, that standard is still there. That's why we are condemned and worthy of judgment as sinners, because the law is still there as the standard. It didn't disappear. It comes again through Moses. 
in the form of the Ten Commandments. As Romans 10.5 says, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. Yes, if you perfectly obeyed God's moral law, if that was possible, you would enter life. The bad news is it's not possible. So you're thinking, yeah, I thought having eternal life was by grace through faith alone. Indeed it is for us. But that law, that moral standard is still there. Did you ever wonder why Jesus Christ didn't drop out of the sky as a grown man and die on the cross immediately? If his death was all that was needed to satisfy God's justice for us and, ju and save us, why did he spend 30-something years walking around doing what he did? It's because that standard of righteousness was still there to be fulfilled. What Adam failed to do still needed to be satisfied. Think of it like a bank account. That's what justifying, that's what satisfying God's justice is like. You can have a negative balance or a positive balance. You can be in the red or in the black. Sin is being in debt. In fact, that's how the Bible often talks about it. Forgive us our debts, we pray. We are debtors to God's justice for sinning, violating his law. So Jesus' atoning work, his passive obedience, is him paying your debt. Is that enough to have eternal life? Has that satisfied God's justice? No, you're just up to zero. You're where Adam was. The law remaining to be fulfilled. Righteousness needing to be fulfilled. We don't just need Christ's death, but his life. That's why Jesus lived life as well as dying on behalf of his people. He fulfilled all righteousness, as he told John before being baptized. That's why Paul calls Jesus the second Adam, because he obeyed the law as a covenant of works. He did what Adam failed to do. And so, if you believe on Jesus Christ, your debt is transferred to his account, paid. His infinite balance of righteousness is transferred to your account. As if you had personally, perfectly kept the commandments. As R.C. Sproul provocatively put it, salvation is by works. The works of Jesus Christ. We receive it by faith alone. We receive it by faith alone. Now, to connect this, the rich young man is acting like the fall didn't happen, and he is still able to keep the commandments. He is blind to his condition. Isn't that what it means to be dead in sin? Blind to your own spiritual state? He thinks he can keep the commandments on his own. As Calvin says, the keeping of the law is righteousness by which any man who kept the law perfectly, if there were such a man, would obtain life for himself. But as we are all destitute of the glory of God, nothing but cursing will be found in the law, and nothing remains for us but to betake ourselves to the undeserved gift of righteousness. And so that law, that law is still there, and its function, one of them, is to let you know that you need a savior, that you have fallen short. If you even failed at one point of the law, it's over. You need someone else to have obeyed in your place for you as a substitute. And Christ is that substitute in his life and in his death. And as a believer, that law still reminds you that you are continually in need of God's grace even after being regenerate and converted we still can't perfectly obey because of the remains of sin and so that law still is there functioning in that way reminding us that yes we need Jesus every day all the time so as we'll see the rich man thinks he has obeyed the commandments in verse 20 the young man said to him, 
All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The rich man thinks he's done what Jesus said to do. He doesn't get it. He is ignorant of how God's law actually works. Like most people of his day who thought that they were keeping the commandments because outwardly, externally, they didn't commit adultery. They didn't murder anybody. They didn't steal anybody's stuff. Okay, I've kept it. But no, the law penetrates to the heart, to the words and the thoughts of a person. And if he had been aware, he would have known that, no, he has not even kept that second table of the law that Jesus specifically mentioned. So Jesus says to him in response to, I've kept these, but he knows he still lacks something. What do I still lack? What's missing? Jesus says, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor. What is Jesus doing? Is, is he adding an extra commandment? Is Jesus believing the young man when he says, oh yeah, I've kept the commandments already. Does Jesus believe him? And so he's like, okay, sell your stuff. Is this an 11th commandment? No, not at all. Why is Jesus targeting his wealth specifically? Well, what clues is in is the man's response when Jesus tells him this. In verse 22, when the man heard this, he went away sorrowful. He was grieving when Jesus told him to sell his possessions. Is Jesus telling him to get rid of his wealth because wealth, property, possessions, and money are evil? No. No, they're not. Like any created thing, we can use them wrongly. We can abuse them. We can make them an ultimate thing. We can make them an object of worship. That's what Jesus is getting at. Jesus, in essence, is going to the top of the list. Remember, Jesus did not specifically cite the first table of the law. What he's doing here is going to the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before my face. When God states he doesn't tolerate the existence of any other object of worship other than himself. Jesus is diagnosing this young man as a man who loves his possessions. And that's what Paul actually told Timothy in the New Testament. It is the love of money that is a root of all kinds of evil. This man loves his stuff. Loves it. It is. What's the other word for that? Idolatry. It's his idol. And Jesus says, get rid of it. He grieves. Poked him right in the eye. There it is. That's the problem. So, newsflash, this man has not kept the commandments. Christ just exposed his heart. The second table of the law is easy to get away with, outwardly. This was a righteous man. He thought that about himself. Everybody else did too. As we'll see by the disciples' reaction to this conversation. Outwardly, he's a good person. Jesus goes straight to the heart, as Jesus often does. You love your stuff more than God. He is guilty of idolatry and therefore has not kept the commandments. And Paul connects that with coveting. Covetousness, which is idolatry. One in ten, he's broke the whole moral law of God. He is not a keeper of the commandments. And so what is Jesus telling him to do? Sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Why is he telling him to do that? Are we back to a works righteousness thing? Like, yeah, do this and you'll be saved? No. If his possessions are his idol, 
and Jesus tells him to get away from it, turn away from that, what's the word for what Jesus is telling him to do? Repent. Repent of your idolatry. Like someone who's addicted to alcohol. You don't teach him. You know, moderation is what God wants us to, to have towards all things. It's true. But for someone who's an addict, you remove it. <laughs> That's what Jesus is prescribing for the rich man. You have an idol. Get away from it. Sell it. Give the money to the poor. Remove it. As Jesus said in another place, cut it off. Throw it away. That's what Jesus is doing for the rich man here. Repent of your idolatry. Turn from sin towards God. Repent. And after that, the secondly, come follow me. Will this man be saved? Be justified by physically following Jesus around with the twelve? No. But what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Like the disciples who are there watching this happen. Followers, disciples, are, are learners. They're students of what their teacher teaches. And Jesus, being the Messiah, God incarnate, teaches certain things about himself that change everything. Being the Son of God. <laughs> Jesus is calling this man to faith in him. Repentance and faith is what Jesus is communicating to this rich young man. Get rid of that idol. Exchange your earthly temporary treasures for treasure in heaven. Follow me. He's calling him to true discipleship. Faith in him. Believing in Christ. And following him. Obeying him. Not just outwardly, but inwardly. Not like Judas, but like the 11. Repentance and faith. Christ's call to the rich man is total. Contrary to what he was thinking. You know, I'm lacking. Tell me what last thing I need on top of my already okay life. Uh-uh. Flip that thing upside down. Demolish the old building so that something new can be constructed. Christianity is not just f frosting on the cake. We of ourselves are not okay. We haven't begun on the wrong foot. We're dead on the ground. <laughs> Christianity is not something to complete you. It's a complete revolution. Don't come to church to get some Jesus sprinkles on your ice cream sundae. That is not how it works. Jesus' call is total. It's an upheaval. You go from spiritual death to spiritual life. That's what the rich young man didn't understand. He was a good person, he thought, and everybody thought it. He comes to Jesus, what do I need for eternal life? He wasn't expecting what Jesus was about to say. Get rid of what you love and exchange it for me. That's what Christ said. And how did the man respond to that? He went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The rich young man chose his riches over Christ. He chose temporal wealth over eternal life. He chose perishable and corruptible possessions over treasure in heaven. The cost was too high. He didn't want to pay it. He thought it was a bad deal. And so he rejected Christ's free offer. He'd rather stay in the mud, playing around. Don't answer out loud when I ask this, but does anyone here have the rich man's mentality? Christianity is just icing on the cake for you. It's not the foundation in the center. Christ isn't the foundation of the center, but just something additional. A topping, a garnish. When it comes down to it, 
you don't want to make the total change that Christ commands. It doesn't mean you're not worshiping something. You are. It's just not the right thing. And for some, it might be like the man in this account. It might be wealth, property, possessions, money. Does your life revolve around what you have? Is that the center of your universe? Does all your time, energy, talent, attention go towards your possessions, your property, your wealth, your money? When people look at you, do they, can they tell that you are living for your wealth? Whatever it may be, that's idolatry and must be repented of. And Christ, God, commands repentance. To confess it as sin and trust in Christ for salvation. Christ is a perfect savior because he obeyed those commandments that the rich man and we cannot keep. Christ fulfilled all righteousness and paid the death penalty that our idolatry deserves on behalf of his people. And so the rich man walked away, turning down true riches. And so Jesus evaluates this encounter with his disciples. Let's look at verse 23 to 26. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Jesus makes the obvious statement. Someone who worships money cannot have eternal life. <laughs> Idolaters will not inherit the kingdom, the Bible tells us. It is impossible to cure oneself of idolatry. It is impossible to save oneself. That's what he means by that metaphor of a camel going through the eye of a needle. It's impossible. Can't do it. Only God can do it. And the disciples, I owe this observation to John Calvin, because I so easily missed it. The disciples are shocked. They're astonished. They're affected by Jesus' words, but they don't walk away in sorrow, as the rich young man did. That's, that's worth observing. Wow, that's right. The rich young man was greatly affected by the hard words of Jesus, and he walked away. The disciples are greatly affected by even more hard words of Jesus and do not walk away. Rather, they ask, they inquire, they continue to trust in their Lord. Who then can be saved? They ask. Now, why would they ask such a thing? Jesus is referring to rich people. Rich people cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then the disciples ask, so who can be saved? In other words, that means nobody can be saved. Why would they make that conclusion? They are thinking like their culture. The idea in that day was that wealth corresponded to righteousness. If a person was wealthy, prosperous, this might sound familiar, then it was evidence of God's covenant blessing on that individual. You obey as an individual and the covenant blessings that God promises in the Old Testament belong to you. And the vice versa being true. If you are 
poor if you are sick, afflicted with something, you know, somebody sinned somewhere. You hear the religious leaders talking that way throughout the gospel. This is the idea that is coming up here in the disciples' comment. So when Jesus says that the rich person cannot enter the kingdom of God, that means nobody can in the mind of the disciples and everybody else. It's an inference. They're reasoning from the greater to the lesser. This rich young man, if anybody was a candidate for the kingdom of God, it's that guy. That's him. But if Jesus just said he cannot enter the kingdom, okay, it's all over for the rest of us. He was it. He had the best chance. <laughs> but if Christ says it's impossible for that guy, nobody is getting saved. Nobody's entering the kingdom. That's their thinking. And Jesus turns around and says, you're right. <laughs> With man, it is impossible. Yeah, they understand him correctly. The rich man can't save himself. Nobody can. Jesus looks at them and says, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now, I want to spend five minutes explaining what this doesn't mean, but I won't. This phrase right here, with God all things are possible, is one of those favorite evangelical cliches that people rip out of context and use like a blank check for whatever fantasy they have. With God all things are possible. Yes, whatever I want, God will do it. That's not what Jesus is saying. With God all things are possible. What's he referring to? It fits right here in this narrative. With man, it, meaning, or this, salvation, is impossible. But with God, all things, even your salvation, is possible. With man, this, entering the kingdom of God is impossible. But with God, all things, even your salvation, is possible. That's what Christ is saying. And that's good news that it's not left to you or me. It would never happen. It would never happen. These are comforting words. With man, entering the kingdom of God, entering into life is impossible. But with God, it is possible. It's not a blank check for whatever you want. Because as we see, that rich man, yeah, it was possible for God to save him. But he didn't. The man walked away in his sorrow. And so we see this continual line of thought from the beginning of Jesus' conversation with the rich young man until now. No one's good, only God. What's the standard of righteousness you need to meet to enter eternal life on your own? Keep the commandments. You can't. You worship something other than God. It's impossible to enter the kingdom on your own. But with God... It is. God, the standard of good, ensured that that righteous standard be met by the Lord Jesus Christ as a substitute for his people. Salvation is God's work from beginning to end. Unless one is born again, regenerate by the Spirit, he will not respond in repentance and faith. And repentance and faith are granted that's how it's communicated in the New Testament. God granted them repentance. God granted them faith. Those are gifts from God even. Gift of God. Grace alone. Our salvation is God's work from the first to the last. And so the disciples then ask one final question. The rich man chose not to give up his wealth to follow Jesus. But the disciples had. They had done that. Where does that leave them? So our final part here. Follow Jesus no matter the cost. 
and look forward to future glory. Verses 27 to 30. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So Peter asks, okay, the rich man wasn't willing to give up his things to follow Jesus. But we did that, disciples. So what do we have now? What will we have? That's a good question. Good question, Peter. And Jesus gives an eschatological answer. He's referring to a future period. The end of history. The consummation when Christ returns. As he says... In the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. And if you are using your NASB translation, you see the word regeneration there can also be rendered the renewal of all things. What event, what period of time is Christ referring to? He's referring to the restoration. Christ returns and restores creation. Curses wiped away, the effects of the fall are gone. This is the end of history. The new heavens and new earth. When Christ is seated on his throne. That's what he's referring to. And he addresses Peter and company directly, saying they will sit on 12 thrones and rule and reign with Christ. And the irony here is this is in stark contrast to the rich young man who in the other gospels is referred to as the rich young ruler. He rejected Christ's offer of selling his possessions and exchanging them for treasure in heaven for his worldly status and authority. He's not gonna be ruling anybody in the end. The disciples who have left things to follow Christ, they will rule and reign with Christ. What a reversal. And that helps us understand that last line. Many who are first will be last and last first. And Jesus speaks of the whole church. He says, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold, a hundred times, and will inherit eternal life. Jesus is teaching that the future state of glory will surpass anything sacrificed in this life. If you have left anything for the sake of following the Lord Jesus, you will receive so much more than what you lost. A hundred times more. The future state of blessedness with the Lord forever will far outweigh any losses or sacrifices in this life. And that clarifies again that very last line that Jesus often uses. But many who are first will be last and the last first. The current status of people, their honor, their prestige, their wealth, that doesn't guarantee their place in the future when Christ consummates his kingdom. Just because somebody is at the top in this life doesn't mean they'll be there in the end. 
And the case in point is the rich young man himself. In everybody's eyes, he's a candidate for eternal life. That was everybody's assumption. Jesus flips that over. Nope. Many who are first, like him, will be last. And many who are last, the disciples, they've left everything to follow the Lord Jesus, to believe in him. And they would continue to lose things, ultimately their lives, in martyrdom for the sake of the gospel. In the world's eyes, to unbelie in an unbelieving perspective, that's, a, that's a losing. You're a loser. <laughs> but Christ gives us an eternal perspective here. An eternal perspective. He's told us the end of the story. He's given us the whole picture. Future glory. Far outweigh what we have lost here in this life. And the parable that follows in the next chapter is Jesus illustrating that principle of the first being last and last first. I'm not going to read it. That's not our text this morning. To directly apply this, you cannot give up more than what Christ will give you. I love how J.C. Ryle says it. We may rest assured that no man shall ever be a real loser by following Christ. As believers, we still struggle with idolatry because of the remaining corruption of sin. No? We do. Unfortunately, that's a clear and present danger for us. Until we are glorified, it will be a fight. But a fight that we are given the power to fight by God's grace. We still struggle with idolatry. And the continual call is one of repentance. The whole Christian life is one of repentance. That wasn't a one-time thing <laughs> that started things off. No. The law is still there. And that still identifies our idols. That still identifies our sins. And when we identify an idol, how do we respond to that? Don't grieve and turn to despair. But flee to Christ. Continually. Regularly. In repentance. We deal with the idolatry. We turn away from it and towards God once again. Those idols, they'll always disappoint us. And any of those things, that's not a real loss. Christ has told us the end of the story. What you have had to give up in this life, either because you have started worshiping that thing or you've had to lose things merely for being a Christian. We'll receive a hundred times more. That's an understatement. <laughs> All those promises that God made, the physical blessings that we see all throughout the Bible, we do believe that those will be materially, physically, literally fulfilled in the end. What we have right now are spiritual blessings. Justification, adoption, sanctification in this life, peace with God, the fruit of the Spirit. But in the end, creation is restored. The curse is wiped away. Everything is made new, and ultimately, the re redemption of our physical bodies. And we will have a literal, physical, abundant existence forever with Christ. Anything that we may give up in this life for the sake of the Lord cannot even compare to what the future holds for us. And so because Christ has told this, we can persevere. We can have patience. And if you ever have to give something up for the sake of Christ, in the worst case example, the police come to your door one day and say, 
Christians no longer have a right to property. Are you one? God forbid. It happens in other parts of the world. That's a moment of truth right there. How do we count loss in this life? Do not count the cost too high. Because it's not. The rich young man thought he would be a loser if he gave up his property to follow Christ. He thought that was a losing deal. He thought he was getting swindled by Jesus. He had no idea. It was a steal. Give up your temporary possessions for treasure in heaven that cannot rust, that moths can't eat, that can't be stolen. Wow. You get Christ himself. Christ freely offers himself. And that is infinitely worth more than the all of the creation. That's, that's winning. <laughs> We're not real losers. That is so much better. Christ has given us an eternal perspective. And we look forward with hope, even as we continually repent, continually believe in Christ, continually follow the Lord. We look forward to future glory. And that is how we live our life as true disciples of the Lord. That is my exhortation to all of you. Remember this. Having eternal life is impossible by our good deeds, but possible with God. Therefore, repent of your idols, believe in the Lord Jesus, and follow him looking forward to glory. Let us pray. Father, we come before you instructed, corrected, and given understanding and illumination by your spirit, working by and with the word. And we ask that you would continually change our hearts. Help us to think according to what you have revealed here. Lord, we thank you that you make us willing and able to obey you. And we ask that you would continue by your word to identify those things that we tend to raise up into objects of worship in our life. Help us to identify them and put them back where they belong. Draw our eyes back to the Lord Jesus. Help us to continue, help us to continue killing that sin. And Lord, when we do lose things, for the sake of Jesus, or when we do have to get rid of things because we idolize them, we ask that you would remind us from your word about what the future holds, that there is more than this temporary wealth. There is treasure in heaven awaiting for us because of what Christ has done on our behalf. And we thank you that it is all of grace without Christ paying our debt and fulfilling righteousness for us, we would have nothing. And we thank you for opening our eyes and drawing us and uniting us to Christ. Otherwise, left to ourselves, we would walk away in sorrow with that rich young man. We acknowledge that we did not save ourselves, but you have done it. It is your work. We thank you and we praise you. We ask that you would help us to live boldly a life of gratitude. We love you and we thank you. All these things we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. I believe the Lord has ministered to us individually. And... Uh, one thing to summarize what uh, Brother Nate shared to us this morning is that from the beginning to the end, salvation is all by God's grace. Amen? Amen? But that does not mean, because when we say grace, it's a merited favor, something that 
we do not earn, we do not deserve, but that does not discount us from um, working out the salvation that the Lord has given to us. We are saved for good works. And sometimes what attacks, what what veers us off from living according to God's grace are our daily idols, our daily tendencies to give in to them. And my prayer for all of us is that we continue to fight according to the grace and strength that the Lord will provide. And uh, continue to look to the cross because the Lord has already finished all His work. And we, we work out, out of victory. As someone would say, we work from victory, we fight from victory. That's what Christ has done for us. Let's all rise up and uh, let's sing our final song. And let's continue to meditate on the truth of the gospel. That the Lord has finished everything for us. He cried, it is finished. And therefore, we should not fear. Lord, we praise you. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's sing this song completely done.
what you complete is completely done. Where heirs with Christ the victory won. What you complete is completely done. Father God, we praise you because of the cross, O oh God. We praise you, Lord, for Jesus Christ finished work, Lord. Salvation, Lord, is by the work of Christ received by us through faith. And thank you, Lord, because even the just penalty of all the sins that we've committed, Lord, they are all being paid for on the cross by Christ. Hallelujah. It's completely done. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your goodness, your love, your grace, Lord. We do not deserve, Lord, even the continual work that you have been doing in teaching us, in exhorting us to look to Christ. Because, Lord, from beginning to the end, salvation is by your works. Lord, our work, Lord, is based on what you have completely done for us. I pray, dear Father, help us, Lord, to leave behind all our temporal loves for the sake of the one great prize, and that is Christ, Lord. I pray, Lord, open our eyes to see your beauty. There's so much worth and value, Lord, every single day. Father God, we thank you for the time that you have given us to fellowship today, to offer our praises to you, and the opportunity, Lord, to listen to your word and to receive it with all our hearts, Lord. Lord, dismiss us with your love this morning and allow us, Lord, to go out in obedience and faith, Lord. Thank you, Father, because this morning also we can continue to offer to you our tithes, our grace gifts, and our offerings, Lord God. Lord, you are so much more worthy even, Lord, with this material wealth, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We now go with the love of the Lord.